Hey everyone, and welcome to the second of our GAA PDSD Future Leaders podcast webinars. My name is Sally Fox, and this is the second in the series of our five podcasts, which will be broadcast between now and the end of the school year. So as always, the GAA would like to give a huge thank you to the PDSD for their fantastic continued support of the Future Leaders program. So today we're going to be discussing nutrition and strength and conditioning and all the well-being aspects of both from a teenager's point of view. To do that today, I am delighted to be joined by John Murphy and Dermot Carr. So John is a PE teacher in St. Mary's Secondary School, New Ross, and he is doing his PhD on physical activity and well-being in DCU and is a Future Leaders PDSD associate. John has worked with a number of GAA clubs and county teams over the past few years and is also one of the hosts on the Followers podcast. Dermot is a PE and geography teacher in school Natrinoda Nefa in Dune in County Limerick. He is an assistant SNC coach with the Tipperary Senior Hurlers and was part of the setup when they won the All Ireland in 2019. Dermot is also a Future Leaders PDSC associate. He also has completed a master's degree in strength and conditioning in 2018. So you're two very busy men. Um, so it's great to have you here, guys. So welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, um, So, Dermot, you're one of the strength and conditioning coaches with the Tipperary Senior Hurlers. So can you tell us a little bit about that? It must be fair busy like. So can you tell us a bit about the 2019 um, buzz of being in Croke Park and the All-Ireland final day? Yeah, yeah, I suppose, yeah. Um, I suppose it's not busy at the moment anyway. That's one thing, unfortunately, in some ways. But yeah, I'm the assistant uh, strength and conditioning coach with Tipperary. Um, so the main guy involved is a guy called Carbra or Carillon. Uh, he's a Belfast. He's from Belfast. Um, so he's quite a... He's, I would rate him as probably one of the best SNC coaches in the country, actually. So I feel really privileged, I suppose, to work with him and get to learn from him. Um, so he's like, he's come from, he was work, working in the Arsenal Academy. He was working with the Arsenal ladies football team. He has an Aussie rules background. So uh, I've, I'm blessed, I suppose, to be able to work with him. So I suppose I see my role in that then as being like, he is, the, he's brilliant he's excellent so my role is to support him in allowing him to be that I suppose so that's kind of I suppose that's what I kind of try to do well yeah. um, so with that with Tipperary how that kind of works is um, I suppose because we have so many players over different counties and even Tipperary itself is such a large county um, rather than bringing players to Turles five times a week and say for three pitch sessions or two gym sessions we have a we have a kind of pods for the gym so the gym, we have, it was a North Tipperary group, and we say another group that goes to Turles. Um, so I would take the North Tipperary group um, in the gym twice a week, and then we do pitch sessions then in, in Turles. Um, I suppose my main job in pitch sessions, um, I suppose my main thing is I, I do quite a bit of work with, so people who can't take part in the main session, um, I do quite a bit of rehab work with them um, on the sideline. Uh, and then just help with Carver help setting up. Um, then there's a lot of stuff, I suppose, away from, I suppose it was an eye opener for me. Um, there's so much stuff away from the pitch as well uh, that we just like monitoring training loads. So I suppose I'm, that's one of my main roles is monitoring the training loads. So we, we, we would try not to make sure that they, their load gets too high because it's just one of the, a huge thing for an increased risk of injury. So we use an RPE scale. Um, so it's just basically where we get them to rate the training session out of 10 in terms of difficulty and then using that figure we can just kind of feed that into an app that we use and we can kind of see where our training load is at so I suppose I gather all that data together and feed it feed it onto Cabra um yeah GPS then is another one that takes up for the time like I suppose the GA is funny like I um even talking to Cabra who's come from a professional background in that like you know you have teams of people who are involved so you've like a GPS team and you have like a you know, you have a rehab team and things like that. The GA, in the GA, like, we have to put on so many hats, but it, it, it's brilliant at the same time because, you know, like, I mean, I wouldn't have got such exposure to learn, you know, about so many different systems and so many different applications of technology and things like that. So so from that perspective, I, I, I'm really enjoying the job. Um, so on to it, 2019. Yeah, I, I started in 2019, I suppose. I just started, I suppose, I, I'd worked for four years at Six Mile Bridge, uh, hurlers and I'd learned I'd, I'd learned a lot from them and um, I suppose I'd be very grateful to John O'Mara out there he took a punt on me like I didn't have any background in SNC I was just a PE teacher and they needed an SNC coach so my brother was actually doing stats for them out there he lives out in Clare 
and uh, in Six Mile Bridge. So he had asked me to come in and I did. And then four years later, I kind of found I was enjoying it. So I studied a master's in SNC on the back of what I did with Six Mile Bridge. And when that management team finished after four years, I was kind of going, right, what's my next thing I'm going to do? And Liam Sheedy was after starting with Tipperary. And I just, I suppose, I started making inquiries at the right time to know if there was any chance I'd get an internship in there and learn. And I just started acquiring at the right time. And yeah, so from that, that's where I've been. Uh, it's been busy. I have a very patient wife. Um, I'm gone five times a week, uh, generally, sometimes more. Um, and I, that's the big thing, again, uh, like... I, I really, I thought I had an idea of the commitment that the players do, um, but it's been a massive eye-opener for me, the commitment. Like, like if we have a pitch session at half seven, like there's people showing up just after half five, quarter to six for that pitch session at half, you know, it's, it's incredible. You yeah. know, they're getting ready, they're doing their prehab, they're doing their stretches, they're doing their activation, they're getting their rub, the rub from the masseuse or whatever. You know, and, you know, so they're there and maybe they're not leaving until half nine or ten o'clock, you know. So that's a big block of people's day when you're trying to hold down a nine to five job and things like that as well and travel home. So that's it's been a huge learning curve from that. But it's, it's I must say it's really enjoyable. Um, the players are fantastic. They're lovely. They're really nice guys. The backroom team, the management teams involved are just they're really nice people. I'd like to count a lot of my friends, actually, rather than just work colleagues. Um, that's, and that's how I would feel about them. I, very fond of a lot of them now, I really am, and I'm very lucky to be involved. So, yeah, yeah. that's it. That's, I suppose that's my background, how I got there, I suppose. Mm. Yeah, like, it sounds so interesting, because I feel like a lot of us don't know the amount of effort and the amount of commitment that goes into it, but it seems mm. like mammoth work, you know. But, yeah, that's yeah. Really, really interesting. Yeah, and, and I suppose that's why, like, you know, players, the setups need to be good for players because they're giving so much of their time and they're giving yeah. so much, you know, of themselves that, you know, I suppose it's up to me and other people in the background to ensure we've ever in the place for them to to perform because that's all they want to do. They, they want to perform to the best of their ability. That's their that's their goal. That's what they're there for. That's what they want to do. And it's our job to, I suppose, to do that and they challenge us to do that. And that's yeah. we've to race to that challenge every time. That's that's brilliant. That's really good. And so, um, John, you've completed your PhD in DCU. So can you tell us briefly what area you're researching? Yeah, not completed yet, about a year to go, but we're looking at um, the relationship between physical activity and well-being. So because well-being has become such a buzzword over the last few years and particularly even in the last year, so many people are saying, well, being active is so good for your mental health. So we really want to dig in and see, first of all, is it good for your mental health and your well-being? And if so, why? So that if we're making recommendations in the future, did we know, okay, why are we recommending this type of exercise or this amount of exercise or exercise done this way over another type to see what actually does benefit mental health? So we started off with a questionnaire that was available to every school in Ireland with 5,600 respondents just to see what, what's the current relationship like at the minute? Like, is being more active beneficial for your mental health? So we found it was um, up to a certain point that once you get to kind of like the main recommendations at the minute are 60 minutes every day. If you get that four to five times a week, it's possibly not enough to improve physical fitness, but it's generally enough to support good mental health. And we found as well that playing a sport and team sport in particular seem to have the best benefits for it. So just being active on its own is a help, but there's far more benefits to, to being active with a group of people, plus all the like, numerous challenges you have when playing team sport you lose games but you know you're there for each other when you lose you pick each other up there's the highs and the lows and it's all those contributing together that we think but you know we're we're still digging a bit deeper into that yeah it has been a very difficult time for people over the last um number of months because of lockdowns because there's no matches no training no gyms open so from a well-being point of view good nutrition healthy eating and staying active is hugely hugely important so john what are some like simple tips you could give teenager um in the whole area of you know nutrition and healthy eating especially in the time at the moment when everyone's not that active you know so one of the keys with nutrition is eating to support your own activity so if you're not being as active you possibly don't need as much food now to i would 
First of all, and I know Damon is going to touch on this, my first point would be to try and be more active to support getting in more food just because it's, it's a healthier way to approach it. But in general, if you notice, particularly in time coming up to exams and you're just doing loads of study and you're sitting down a bit more, you can slightly reduce the amount you're eating, but only very slightly. The other thing I'd say then, particularly if you are you know, busy around exams, try and plan ahead as much as possible of what you're going to eat and have it where possible prepared and stuff in advance. Then, like around now, if you have that bit more free time because there's just less demands on what we're trying to do, play around with a few recipes and stuff like that because the different skills you can build up around cooking, they're just, in a way, they're a little boost of self-esteem. But also the key to eating healthy is like everyone knows the healthy foods to eat. They're largely the same across everyone. But it's finding different ways of giving them more variety. Like instead of having some boiled chicken, some steamed spuds and some steamed veg, that gets relatively boring after a while. But if you can find different ways to make the, the spuds into like homemade wedges or homemade chips or different types of mash, they can have your chicken in a curry, have it made like a nando or something like that and vary around the different types of veg you're having. Like you're still having chicken spuds and veg but if you have five six seven different ways of cooking it to give you that bit of variety and more ways you're likely to enjoy eating it then you're far more likely to stay eating it yeah see that's the thing with me and I feel like a lot of teenagers I am at the stage now where I'm like I know what I like and I don't want to try anything else I just want to stay with what I like eating but it's not very um you know interesting anymore it's kind of just boring I just tend to be eating the same things so how would you think what's a good way to like introduce new foods i suppose is it just like yeah finding new methods of cooking them and stuff yeah new methods of cooking and trying around a few different spices and stuff like that like i know that the recipe for success book is very good there it gives you different ways of flavoring your foods and different ways of cooking them but even like mixing and matching a bit yourself if it shows you one way to cook salmon you're like oh i enjoyed that i find my chicken very bland i might try cook the chicken that way and see the big thing i'd say though is like, if it doesn't work out the first time, don't worry about it. Like, it's not a failure. It's just something that you're learning. Okay, I won't do it that way the next time. But I might try changing this bit a little bit. Because we're often so afraid of, once you do something wrong, it's a fail. Never go back again. As opposed to, it didn't work this time. But I know what little cha- change to make. You know, it's just constantly feeding into the next time you try it, the next time you try it. Because, like, my favorite way of cooking chicken might be completely different to the Irmids. And if I was to cook for him, he'd be like, no, I didn't like that. But that's fine. If I was to cook it for him again, I'd just tweak it a little bit as opposed to saying that was a fail, didn't work. Yeah, yeah, that's that's brilliant. And then, Dermot, in terms of physical activity, then what should we be doing, especially now, because there's no training matches or like gyms open at all? Yeah, it's. I suppose it depends where you're coming from, Tally. Like, like some people are coming from different bases. Um, you know, so you're going to have some people who will be, they will be normally quite active and they'll be normally involved in team sports. And, you know, the fact that they don't have access to training now is quite difficult for them, you know, but you'd hope that they, they kind of have kept that motivation and they've just, just, I would just say like, like use the outdoors, especially when we're coming into good weather now, like use the outdoors, just get out, you know, go for a walk, listen to music while you're out for the walk, go for a hike, go for a cycle. Like I know if, if you're near water go for a swim just just get active um like i'd be hoping in the next couple of weeks we're kind of seeing uh, with the research too that outdoor activities seem to be relatively safe that like you know the things will be lifted in the next couple of weeks and maybe we'll be able to get back meeting together for outside you know meeting together to get outside to do things so like to meet up with people i think i think like i even find it here myself that like at the start of the very first lockdown i got a gym inside and just bought stuff for a gym equipment in the house and put it into one of the rooms here and I'll be, I'll be honest with you, I've probably never used gym equipment less because I like meeting people, you know, and it's like, you know, I, I, I'm always involved in team sports and things like that. And it's, it's, it's I suppose it's one thing that's made me re- realize I love meeting people and I love exercise and meeting people, you know, so a difficult session isn't as hard when you're sharing with others, you know, and there's a bit of a laugh and a bit through it. Yeah. Um, whereas going into the room by myself and even if there's music on, like, like look, you do it like, but it's not the same you don't get the same buzz from it as yeah. you would. So I suppose that'd be my big recommendation is when we can to meet up with people and just exercise together, you know, just and find something, find a physical activity to do together. And like, if you're at the other end of the spectrum then and like, you know, kind of going, right, I'm only getting back into it. I haven't done anything. I haven't been active at all. Well, don't, don't bite off more than you could chew in the early weeks. You know, just try to reform the habit of just getting out, getting active, 
maybe listening to, you know, watching a yoga video on YouTube in the morning for 15 minutes, maybe, as I said, just going for a walk, maybe, you know, and maybe that might develop on, like, you'd be surprised after, I think this is it's maybe three weeks to develop a habit, like, after you've been doing the thing for so many days, it just becomes part of your routine and you get used to doing it. And just, just, just to do it and don't, no, don't take off more, don't, don't try to do too much. I'd say we've a lot of people here who don't, uh, what I would say is don't apply it as the new year resolution that isn't sustainable. So we always see it in gyms around the country where, you know, everybody, the gym is absolutely wedged in January. Everybody's in the right, this is it, new year, new me, I'm going to do it, you know. And then February, it's a bit quieter. And then March, it's like, it's back to, it's, it's quite empty again, you know. So, and the reason for that is I think people in January try to take on too much. They try to, right, I'm going to like drink, five liters of water today i'm never going to eat any rubbish i'm going to exercise six days a week and i'm going through this i'm going to this i'm going to this and they just overload themselves and it's just uh oh, i can't do this you yeah. know so let's take it in little steps and say right at the end of this week i'm going to focus on maybe eating some healthy healthy foods and maybe getting out doing this bit of exercise say right how did i go to reflect at the end of the first week how did that go you know now go into the second week with another plan and keep changing the plan and i think like like habits like keeping like reflecting on what you did, you know, and it would, it would go in what John was saying too, too, in terms of eating. I think it's a good habit to do no matter what you're doing. So, you know, John was talking about there about a recipe that didn't work. Why didn't it work? What could I tweak? Same thing with physical activity. So why didn't I enjoy that? You know, could I do something to make that better rather than just saying I'm never doing it again? You know, how could I make that more enjoyable for myself? How could, you know, just because your friend likes going running five kilometers, doesn't mean it's a youth to do it. doesn't mean it's a youth to enjoy it, you know. I'll be straight honest, I'll say I wouldn't enjoy running five kilometers, but I would prefer going out doing like a hundred meter shuttles or something like that. That would just, because I just prefer that kind of exercise. So just, you know, tweak it to suit yourself, think about it, but don't, don't be too hard on yourself and don't, after the first week or two, don't say, I'm just too hard and give up. You know, just try to keep at it, small few changes that can, that can build up into big changes over time. Yeah, no, yeah, I completely agree with what you're saying. Like, as you said about the meeting up with people, I feel like half the crack of exercising as such is meeting up with people because I feel like when I meet up with people I'm more motivated to do it because you know if you just don't exercise you only kind of are depending on yourself whereas other people are depending on you to keep going which kind of (laughs) what's what's another good one actually Sally there is just put in like is I think so see and I'd even find it myself like if I haven't for whatever reason I haven't gone to the gym in three four five weeks the thoughts of going in to do that first session is just like, oh, I'm going to be sore for a couple of days after this. I'm going to find this really hard. And I, and that's the same for a lot of people. If you haven't been doing it for so long, the thoughts of that first session and how you're going to feel after it is just going to be, oh, God. But actually, once after you've had it, you don't, it it's never as bad as you thought it was going to be. And after you've done, then it, that's the worst it's going to be. The second yeah. one you do after that will be a little bit easier. The third one a little bit easier. The fourth one a little bit easier. Just take your time and work your way through it. That's kind of the best thing. That's kind of I apply to myself and I would advise other people to do also. Yeah, I feel like I I build up exercise like bigger than it is in my head. Like the thought of doing it so much worse than actually doing it. And I, you always feel like 10 times better after doing it. So yeah. 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 <laughs> I think so it, it, it's important uh, there to have and set yourself minimum levels of success. So this week, I want to like say you're currently fairly inactive and you take around 4,000 steps a day. We'll just say that a successful day for me would be to take 5,000. You can take way more than that if you want. And if it's like your example, the area we're going to the gym, like I'd say to people to start, go to the gym and spend five minutes there. You don't even have to do anything. Just spend five minutes there and you can leave if you want. You'll find after spending five minutes there, it's actually easier to do something than it is to leave. Or same if you want to go for a walk. You just go outside your house, take 100 steps, after 100 steps, you can turn around and come straight back home. But once you're out there, you're like, I might as well take a 1,000 now while I'm here. Yeah, might as well. And it's so much easier to build on something really, really simple and achievable as opposed to setting yourself this lofty goal that just becomes harder and harder to meet every single time. Mm-hmm. Yeah, just like little and frequent is what I tend to do. And so you mentioned off air, Dermot, like about the influence that Instagram and other online platforms has on teenagers, like especially in the whole area of nutrition and SNC. So sometimes that can be positive but not always so do you want to like elaborate on that if you want yeah um like i, I suppose I, I don't want to come across as an old fogey here on this like but it's just it's something that i've noticed i suppose in school as a p teacher um 
you know, like a student might come up to me and, sh and show me like maybe like a gym plan that they've, oh, I'm going to have to get this online, I'm going to have to get this, uh, what you think of this, and I'd be looking through it and I'd be going, going God, I would take that out, I would take that out, and I would take that out. You no, know, like exercises that might be like like real fixed um, fixed equipment exercises, like you're targeting one muscle group, and I'd be like, that's not really good for you, you know, like especially if you're into team sports, that's not really going to help your performance in a team sport setting. So like my thing is with, with Instagram, like, and we see it all the time is there are some people in there who are, I suppose we call them influencers who, you know, their goal is to look good. That's their goal is to look good. It's the aesthetics of what they do. So their product is selling themselves as looking good. But a lot of, we say the people I work with in schools that like they, they maybe want to make a county team or they just want to go play with their club. Like, and you know, you're, you're asking your body to maybe run eight, nine, maybe the faster of us will do 10 meters a second come to a dead stop, change direction, chase after somebody, get tackled, get hit, and do all of those things. Um, and the person who's maybe plugging that, they don't have to do that. That's not what they need to do. They're not asking their bodies to do that. They're asking their bodies to look good at a certain point of time. And that's it, like, you know, so I would kind of just question, look at where you're getting your source of information from that might help. I suppose, especially with, if you're going to be playing team sports and the type of exercises that you're doing. You know, like I just, I see people like with, like with knee extension exercises and hamstring and like hamstring curl exercises like that and programs. And I'm like going, ah, uh, just a straight, it's a straight red flag for me, unless it's been prescribed by a physiotherapist for a rehab purposes, it's a straight red flag for me as an exercise to avoid. Um, so like, I would kind of say, you know, look at other sources. The GA at the moment are bringing out like a pathway. So they're, they're bringing out a new pathway for like bringing people from kids right up to adulthood and a pathway they should be following. And the, and like the people involved in it are just fantastic. Like I know Carbra, who is with Tip S and C's, is involved in putting it together. They brought Des Ryan. Um, so Des Ryan is another guy who's like he formulated the Arsenal Academy. The Arsenal Academy is always noted as being one of the produced some of the best athletic players. And Des is the person who's he's an Irish guy who's like he founded that and set that up. And he's actually back working now in Ireland uh, with Satanta College. I see this week, but he's been behind this GA pathway and. Um, I would say to really start looking at that for, you know, get your sources for exercise and your workouts from there. Even other people on Instagram, like, like John has some unbelievable resources on his FHS performance. So he didn't ask me to plug him now, by the way. <laughs> but like, he has some fantastic ideas on his website there that's just like, that are so applicable, that are excellent. You know, and you know, you know, they're coming from as somebody who is, that's, that's what they want you to achieve. And you know that it's, you know, this kind of has a pathway to it, that it's not about, for this moment in time, you're going to look good and regardless of like the health effects of that, like do those people feel good? You know, maybe they do. I'm not saying they don't, but there's a, there's an added pressure. I suppose, John, like there's a, a huge crossover in yours in terms of nutrition, like like some of the nutrition things that you see some of those people plugging, you're kind of going, oh man, no. You know, and I suppose I'd, I'd probably leave that over to you. That's your area of expertise. Yeah, you just have to be mindful. It, it's generally like, like nutrition has to be taken in the whole and how it all contributes just in terms of the amount of food coming in for you and your activity levels. And everyone always wants the quick fix. Like what's, what's the supplement that'll give me more energy, that'll make me fitter, that'll make me stronger. And realistically, sorry now to burst everyone's bubble, there probably isn't one that like no supplement is really going to work unless you have like your general eating practices and not just the food, but the practices around it, your relationship with food and the general times you have meals and who you have them with, they're far more important than any, any one supplement or any one nutrient that you're going to take in. Yeah, no, like I'd say I fall into the trap a bit of that. Like, you know, I, I look at celebrities and wonder like, oh, why don't I look like them? And it's just like the muscle definition, everything by them is crazy. But I suppose, as you said, like they mightn't be that, fit like you know what I mean it's all kind of just for show but I think that's hard to kind of wrap your head around when every time you pick up the phone you see someone who looks so much better and so much um like more defined and everything but sure at the end of the day they're just doing it for show like that's their job to look good I'd be, I'd be friends with a bodybuilder and he said like the time when he feels the absolute worst is when he's at his leanest just before he steps on stage his energy levels are pretty much not there he's starving he's cranky he's tired he's no strength he has no fitness whatsoever mm -hmm. because the level of diet it takes to get down to that stage and when he does the show and he does a bit of a photo shoot around then as well he looks great in all of them and a few months later when his energy and his mood and everything picks back up again 
he still has the pictures and they might go on social media on Instagram wherever like that and he says feeling great here's a picture of me looking great but like how he felt when he took the picture and how he feels there and then are worlds apart and you need to bear in mind that so many people like they could take all the pictures that they put up for the next six months all at once in, in, in the, over the course of a day with a few different outfit changes and realistically they don't look like that year round they might look at it for like one moment in time and use that then to promote what they're doing what they're taking what they're eating everything that way and you have to just look through it a little bit more of a critical eye on on why they're doing that then as well yeah and then um john in your research you have like encountered positive and negative impact of social media on mental health so like screen time versus time spent physically active and that effect so can you elaborate a bit on that yeah so we looked we just asked how long on average do you spend on on social media per day and interestingly enough that those who spent zero to one hours so you're spending an hour or less had the best well-being lowest anxiety and depression interestingly enough then those who spent no time at all on it actually had slightly lower well-being and higher anxiety and depression i'm going to get this because they didn't choose to not spend time they're being forced to not spend time by parents taking phones away or not allowing them on and then as they spend an extra hour anxiety and depression dipped a little bit or sorry anxiety and depression went up a bit and well-being went down a little bit for every extra hour and we were kind of wondering why is that so we started looking into other studies done it's not a case of as you look at the phone there's some chemical reaction that happens in your brain from the blue light to bring it down it's more so that your social media feed and that's generally instagram but there are obviously other ones used as well it's a constant reel of highlights from other people and it's always people having nine or ten out of ten days and you're just seeing them having a great day and you might, they might only put up every six weeks or six months but you see them at their best on average we probably all have like six or seven out of ten days you know you've ups you've downs you know but on general it's fairly average days if you're sitting there having an average day and you see 20 people having great days like oh look at he's just got a new dog, he's just gotten married, he's just had a new child, he's just won a county final. And you're constantly seeing like everyone else's highlights and you're starting to feel, oh, my day is like so average. And what you thought was, oh, this is a fine day, suddenly starts to go down a little bit in terms of how good you feel it is. And it's the constant looking at, looking at other people's highs that starts to bring your average down a little bit in terms of how you perceive it. So it's worth bearing in mind that you're only seeing them once, like the bodybuilder who's taken the picture, like who, the person who has the perfect lighting for that photo. You could have taken them 30 or 40 shots just to get that one picture. So bear in mind how they felt looking at all those before they put that one up. Um, and like when you're having your normal day, they have loads of normal days too. And they have loads of below normal days. And they're often dependent on that one highlight to show everyone how happy they are. Whereas realistically, don't compare yourself to that. It's compare yourself to like your average and just embrace that. Everyone has really good days. Everyone has really bad days. And it's how you react to them as opposed to compared to everyone else that's important. Yeah, no, I, I feel like that's really important because as you said, all we're seeing is their best bits. Um, because like, it's really difficult, I think, for teenagers, especially in the current situation. The current situation, we all do fall into the trap of like staying on our phones. Um, but I saw in 2020, there was over 2.5 million Snapchats sent per minute, which I just think is absolutely crazy. So like being mindful then of COVID, how do you think we can get away from our phones and be more active? I think to set yourself up with a couple of little boundaries and times that like, what I find, find really helpful, like I'm just taking social media off my phone completely. So if I want to see what's happened on Twitter, I have to log on to my laptop. I, to, I don't have it anywhere that I can access. So I have to Google it. I have to log in. And when I'm finished, I log out. So it just creates those little small barriers to actually get there. If you do have it on your phone, every time you're finished using it, log out. So you actually have to log back in. So when you have like 20 seconds to spare and you just tap the Instagram app, I have to log in. Oh, it's not worth it. I'm going to go do something else. Are saying that like if I want to go on social media, I have to stand up, and like just even making it that little bit harder or a little bit of rule for yourself instead of sitting there scrolling away. Okay, I have to stand up. Oh, I don't want to stand up. I'm just going to put my phone down. Or if you are going for a walk, just leave the phone home and, and go for a walk without it. And little things like that, just to create little barriers of getting to it, but also spending time away from it, and you just start to appreciate that time a little bit more. I definitely recommend trying to sleep with your phone outside your room. Like if you're going charging, charge it downstairs overnight and sleep it out. Like buy yourself a cheap alarm clock or something like that. You know, like there's more ways of getting an alarm than, than just your phone. Yeah, 
yeah, no, I'm made to throw my phone outside the door. My parents say no phones in the room, no electronics. I don't know where. I think my mom heard some doctor say it and now she's mental about it. She's like, no phones in the room. Um, but Dearman, what do you think about that then? Yeah, and I, I think that's a brilliant, that's a, like brilliant advice from John. Like, and, and you know, just even that one about having it in the room, I think is huge. Like, you know, John said, like we've said that there's no one supplement like that can help with your mood, that can give you more energy, that can, we'll say, help with your concentration levels, that can do all of those things for you. But actually there's a thing you can do and that's like try to get, you know, close to nine hours sleep a night. And like I often say to people, like if I, if, if I gave you a, a tub of a supplement here and said, this is going to give you all of these things, you would take it every single day without fail. But yet, if we get nine hours sleep a night, it can help with our mood, it can help with concentration, it can help with like even hunger pans, energy levels, even injury risk in sport, like, like there's so much associated with sleep. And so if we can be getting the eight to nine hour sleep of really good sleep a night, all of those things will improve. And you, it's amazing how that transfers to your physical activity levels, your stress levels, your, your school, even your performance in school. And the real good way of doing that is actually leave the phone outside, you know? Or if you have the computer, like like computers inside, like, and it's a, it's a huge thing, like it's been a downside, I suppose, of COVID is the amount of screen time people have had, whether it's been with school or whether it's been on the computer, like, because, you know, you just don't get that wind down time before you go to go to sleep and then you bad sleep habits and you're probably not getting it as deep a sleep as you would get as if you weren't on a screen before you went to sleep, etc. And if we could just get that, just aim for that, like, you know, aim for that and see what's the effect of it. And you'd be surprised as you get more used to it. It's, um, it's incredible what, what it does, that, that extra amount of sleep. I read a book actually on it there oh, it's two years ago, uh, Why We Sleep. And oh, my, <laughs> I, I actually like it nearly frightened me. Um, like the years that I hadn't, that I'd been spent, that I just wasn't so conscious of how important sleep was because of all of the things associated with like you take anything and if you've had a really bad sleep you can be traced back to it you know like it's just it's just as such a resetting and a replenishing and a recharging influence on the body that it's so important so i would say like like bring that in as well as your physical activity and your nutrition try to develop something around your sleep habits and i think as john said leaving the phone outside and getting away from social media after a set time at night is a really good way of doing it so like if you go normally go to bed at we'll say half 10 to be up for a half seven or something, but say, right, from eight o'clock, no screen time. And I'm just going to whatever. It's just going to allow the brain to just start winding down a little bit better and things like that. And you're just going to get into a better sleep habit from that. Yeah, I can even tell with myself, I am a different person when I haven't had sleep. I mean, I am angry, I'm tired, I'm, I'm just everything. I'm a completely different person. Everyone can tell. My friends would be like, oh, did you sleep last night? And I think it's so... Um, prevalent in teenagers as well if we don't get enough sleep that's it like yeah. a different person but going back to the screen time then I've even noticed with myself and my friends my screen time could be seven hours eight hours which is like a day which is crazy stuff really really mad and it, it kind of just I I'm making a conscious effort now to look at it and to like kind of give myself a kick and be like come on now you need to stop put the phone down but it's just it's not even like spending long times on the phone it's the picking up putting down picking up putting down picking up for five minutes putting it back down up for ten you know what i mean it's that the little small intervals that build up all that time yeah. but it's just like a habit you know and i feel like it's really hard to break at the moment yeah it's and even saying to yourself okay i want to spend less time on my phone it's probably important to actually have something else to do that as opposed to saying i'm going to spend less time on my phone and you just sit there with your arms folded thinking I'm bored I'm just going to go on but actually try and focus on the positive or the thing you want to actually go and do instead and like there's just so many little things you can focus on whether it be going for a walk if like the teachers listen to this if you want to spend less time on the phone like, even if you're going for a drive and sometimes you get tempted to look at it stuck in traffic but put the phone in the boot of the car before ever you go so it just automatically creates that barrier if it's like picking up a book and reading that instead and where you normally sit down like the, the place you generally sit down well just leave your phone the opposite side of the room but have a book left there beside you so that becomes the default to pick up and read as opposed to pick up the phone and scroll through it and having little things that i suppose are a distraction or something to do instead as opposed to just going trying to go straight cold turkey without it yeah i feel like i need to do that myself now i feel like we could all um take a bit of that on board but yeah so going back to then activity like physical activity so I read recently then in children and adolescents I think from six to 17 years 
as Dermot said earlier, we need to do 60 minutes of like moderate exercise a day to kind of just strengthen bones. What advice would you give to a teenager who is currently not active at all, but really wants to start to get active, Dermot? Um, yeah, and it's something I've seen myself, like like just doing different research in school and my own students in school, and I've seen that, that like quite a few are down. And generally, what I found is the ones who aren't involved in team sports tend to find it harder to hit those targets. And um, like those targets, what I would say is they're the goal. And, and I feel for somebody coming from a real low base, the thoughts of doing 60 minutes moderate to vi vigorous physical activity a day is like, oh, no way. I just would not be able to do that. You know, and I think I, I think if we if we try to push that 60 minutes to those people too early, you're straight away. They're just going, no, I'm no way, you know, and put my hands up. I'm not going to do that. So so let's try, let's try create the habit. You know, it's like what we said earlier, create the habit and go out and do something. If you don't hit the 60 minutes that day, you didn't hit it. But, but didn't you do more than the day before? Didn't you do more than you did last week? You know, and that's look at that side of it. Don't be beating yourself up because you didn't hit the 60 minutes. Look at, look at what, you, what you did do. And what you'll see is over the course of a number of weeks, you will probably get to that figure. And because you've built up to it over a few weeks, you will then, you will then retain it. You know, and it's just, it's, it's, that is, it's something that I, I see. Is it, if, we, if we try to hammer down, and something I definitely would have been guilty as, as a PE teacher, like trying to, no, you're not getting 60 minutes. It's not that. Rather than looking at, well, this, look at where you've come. You've come from here to here. That's a huge step. Now a little small steps along the way will get you to there. Like, I think a, a huge thing would be, like, from a PE teacher's perspective, please stop bringing in the notes. <laughs> please stop. You know, I just, like, I know, like, when, when I'm doing a certain block inside PE, if it's, like, circuit training or maybe, you, you know, and within that, we might do the dreaded B test the odd time or something like that. You know, and you're, like, going straight away, the notes coming in, like, they just tend to increase. And I'm kind of going, like, just please stop doing that. And what I love doing, and what I love is when it, a student will come up to me and say, look at I don't feel comfortable inside here in a circuit class. I'm too far behind. And within five minutes of doing this, I'm going to be sweating all over and everyone's going to be looking at me and I feel the whole place going to be looking. I don't feel comfortable doing that. And what I'll always say is, right, what will you do? You know, and maybe for that time, they'll actually go for a walk and I can, you know, as parts of school, I can send them go for a walk and it'll be fine out there. And they'll have maybe got 30 minutes of a walk rather than bringing in the note where they took the note and then they, you know, didn't take, do any physical activity. So have the conversation with your PE teacher inside in that regard, I think, would be a huge habit to change. Rather than saying, I'm not doing it and bringing in the note, do something you will do. There's no PE teacher, I assume not, there's no PE teacher going to say, no, don't go mad at you for doing that. You're trying to have a conversation with them about your physical activity levels. And you're trying to explain why you don't want to take part in a full group session, but this is what you will do. You know, like it's, it's quite frustrating for somebody to come in and like with our school, we're blessed with. We have fantastic facilities. We have a fully equipped out gym. We have a massive sports hall. We have like six basketball courts outside. We have a, an outdoor walk and track. We have so many fantastic facilities. And when somebody comes in and says they're not taking part, like, like does people would give anything for the opportunities you have to be physically active here? Just choose something. Just choose something that you will do, and we'll build that in for the next couple of weeks for you that you can do. You know because. But some schools, some schools would love to have it, and and they don't, and just appreciate, I suppose, what you have in that. Um, mm -hmm. So that would be one piece of advice that I would give. Just as I said, the sixty minutes can seem daunting. Don't try to go out and get that straight away. Build your, build yourself up for a little bit. Look and see where you've come each week, and then go from that and leave the P notes at home, please. John will probably yes. have a few other things. <laughs> Yeah, actually, we've noticed this year that we started giving, obviously with the restrictions and it being more difficult to do PE, we've just started giving way more choice. And we actually haven't had one note all year. That's yeah. among, what, 620 girls and we haven't had one note. And it's just been brilliant because yeah. we've given the students way more choice. When we go back now, well, this is probably, we will be back when this goes out, but when we go back after Easter, like, excuse, I'm just going to, with each group, create little bucket lists of stuff they want to do, so that this is what we really want to do to be active. And I know there is a curriculum there that we are supposed to follow as much as possible, but it's so much more important to enjoy the activity you're doing and to get some form of benefit from it and that the group as a whole has some form of choice. So, no, I'd agree completely with Dermot there, yeah. Yeah, I no, I do really agree with that, the whole notes thing, you see, in my experience from first to third year, that's when a lot of people were bringing in notes and it was mostly girls. Now, I don't know, was it the fact that we had to follow a strict curriculum or was it the age or something, but there was so many more notes. Whereas now and in TY last year for me, 
there have been there's no notes really at all from anyone because we've kind of got to do what we wanted you know the teachers have been like what do you want to do and it's been dodgeball or whatever you know what I mean and people have actually really enjoyed it whereas back in first to third year we had to do soccer one day and we had to do that and people just weren't really big fans of it so yeah I feel like that's really good kind of just ask your PE teachers and try and have that discussion um so then going back to nutrition again John if we're going to exercise regularly it's obviously very important that we eat um properly so this is a very um good topic I think so what's your opinion on the importance of breakfast then <laughs> Like so often we're told that breakfast is the mo most important meal of the day. Realistically, like every meal is important. Like they all contribute to give you energy, give you a chance of nutrients, everything that way. And for a while, I wouldn't have been a big, a big believer of that. I just said, oh, just eat when you feel hungry. And I wouldn't have started feeling hungry till around 12 o'clock in the day. And I thought oh, it was fine. And then for a while, I started forcing myself to eat breakfast a good bit earlier. And I just noticed like, it took a while to notice, but I just had so much more energy throughout the whole course of the day. I started keeping account of my steps on my watch. My steps went up by about three or four thousand a day without making any conscious effort to do it. Just because I had food earlier in the day, I had more energy to use. And subconsciously, I was starting to like preserve energy and not use it up as early in the day. And even like students would have said to me that, God, you're like you're way sharper and quicker to ask or to answer questions now in the first few morning or the first few classes <laughs> in the day. Whereas before I would have been like, you know, ask I'm like, um whereas now it's just straight back out and it's, it's little things you don't really realize like that you don't realize you're missing breakfast when you're in the habit of not having it i know like some people say oh I, i'm actually intermittent fasting like no you're not you just went looking for a reason to justify why you're not having breakfast mm -hmm. if you are having it then like the benefits for activity and for concentration are huge particularly in school like i know us and jamie you probably do as well like that class right before break time like no one is listening to anything I'm saying. It's hard enough to listen to me anyway. But if you're doing that on an empty stomach, it's like three times harder because your concentration is drifting the whole thing because you don't have enough fuel for your brain. Like your brain, your muscles can store energy. Like if you're going to play in a big match or run a long race or whatever, you can eat up the day beforehand and they'll store a decent amount of energy here. Your brain isn't able to do that. It needs that slow, steady supply of fuel to work with. Well, and that's why your breakfast is so important because it's probably 12 or more hours since you've had it. The other thing I'd say on breakfast is to have, try and have some form of protein source there. So if you're having porridge, try and make it with milk or have a couple of boiled eggs or make an omelet. And then to make that as easy as possible, have as much of it prepared the night before where you can. Just because like, if you're struggling to get enough sleep or you're going to bed a little bit later, you're trying to squeeze those extra five minutes next morning, which realistically don't help, but you are trying to squeeze them. So if you can have your overnight oats made the day before, make an omelette the night before because they reheat really well, make some egg muffins, make a granola on Sunday that you can have throughout the rest of the week. It just makes having breakfast an awful lot quicker um, and less hassle-free. So it's easier to get there when you want it. Yeah, like I can never, ever go out of the house without breakfast in the morning. It's just always kind of been... I don't know, it's just been a thing that I do. But I think we did a survey, I think it was last year, or maybe this year in school, asking how many people eat breakfast in the morning before they come to school. And I think it was roughly around eight out of 24 people who eat breakfast in the morning, which absolutely shocked me to my core because I was looking around going, how on earth are you not eating breakfast? Because I'm a different person. As I said, when I don't eat breakfast, I just can't function at all. Um, but then sure, the only thing about that is then half the people, half of the eight people were eating the likes of chocolate cereal and stuff like that for breakfast. So it's like, what's even the point then? So how would you, like, what's a good thing to get people off eating that chocolate cereal and stuff? Is it just like prep beforehand, as you said? Yeah, it is generally. Like even I find if I eat a chocolate cereal, I kind of like, oh, am I having dessert for breakfast? Yeah. And I'm kind of like constantly looking for more sugar or something else chocolate throughout the course of the day. Whereas, like, you obviously can, if you're having a granola, it will have a little bit of dark chocolate chopped up into it. Or possibly, okay, it's probably not the best thing, but if you can have a little bit of chocolate milk in porridge or something that way, or melt a bit of dark chocolate into that, that can be some way of, like, tidying you over from having Cocoa Pops to something porridge-based. But even then, you are trying to probably, in a way, wean yourself off to just mm -hmm. resist those sugary urges as early in the day as possible. Yeah. That's brilliant. That's really <laughs> And John, then with regards to the future leaders nutrition module, um, do you have any tips for TYs completing the food diary task and reflection? 
Yeah, when you're doing the reflection, like obviously you look at the food you eat pre and then six weeks later and the change is there. Obviously, it's important to look at the nutrients and how they change. Are you eating enough calories overall, getting your protein, your fruit and veg? But have a look at the behaviors around your foods. Those eating with certain people tend to bring you in a positive direction or a negative direction. Look at the times you're eating. Were you having the majority of your food between like three o'clock and six o'clock and not in later and not in earlier? So were things spreading out a bit more? How much of your food was eaten in front of a screen? How much of it was one massive meal and then a couple of tiny ones, or it's probably better to have three to four reasonably even ones throughout the day as well. So it's not just about the nutrients on their own, but look at the behaviours around your food and your kind of relationship with them as well. That's that's brilliant, John. Thank you so much. And so, um, as you all know, we use the Brilliant Recipes for Success book as part of the Future Leaders Nutrition module. So it's available in PDF um, form on your school's page online and the Community and Health Department page on GAA.ie. So over the next few weeks, there'll be some additional nutrition-based resources available. So one video and resource will be launched per week and will be available on the GAA Learning YouTube channel and the GAA Community and Health Department website. Um, so over the next following weeks, they'll be covering the following. So in week one, it will be healthy eating guidelines. In week two, it will be breakfast. Week three, it will be lunch. Week four, it will be dinner. And week five, it will be snacks. So guys, I'm going to put you on the spot now. Um, so what is your favorite meal that you've prepared from the Recipes for Success book? Because Dermot, I remember you entered the GAA Solo Healthy Eating uh, Challenge last year. So do you have any personal favorite from the book? Yeah, uh, I did. I entered last last year. Yeah, actually, my first time trying to do. I, I got on the sourdough making express that everyone seemed to do in the first lockdown, so I had to go with that for my first one. Uh, it's improved since. <laughs> um, I suppose I like the fajita recipe. Actually, is one of my favorite one. Actually, I just I just enjoy that type of food anyway. Uh, just to kind of mix it up. So I've tried that a few times, and I do like it. I've also I just find the smoothie ideas to be really good. I'm desperate for like having a smoothie idea and sticking right. I know this is nice. So I'm just having this, 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 and I never change it up. Whereas just looking at the smoothie ideas and that, it just gives you a few things to try in it. And you actually, when you try them, you kind of go, oh, that's nice. and just gives you more options. So I suppose they'd be my meal. Definitely the fajitas uh, with the wedges. I really enjoy that. And I just like the, the different types of smoothies as well. On it. Oh, and then John, what about you? <laughs> Do you have any oh, favorite? Well, I like the, the pancakes. I'm, I'm experimenting with my own recipes lately and I've kind of perfected one that I'm, I'm glued to. But my own favourite from the recipes for success book is the, the shepherd's pie. And even instead of just using the sweet potato, I start, I've start started mixing half sweet potato, half normal potato, just have the mixture of colours on the top. I feel like a great fancy chef doing it. And even the other time, swapping out the beef mince for some turkey mince just to change around a little bit as well. Personally, I think my favorite is the chicken curry or the pancakes. I don't make them though. My dad makes them, but he always makes the chicken curry. And initially I wasn't sure would I like it at all because I'm not a big fan of chicken curry at all. But I know I really like it, but I'm so excited to make the stir fry because I love stir fry so much. It's like my favorite meal ever. So I'm really looking forward to making that actually. Um, but yeah, so thank you so much uh, guys for joining me today. Um, I really enjoyed the chat and I learned a lot about it. Um, and I feel like everyone else did too. So yeah, yeah, you really did give us some helpful advice and um, yeah, hopefully that will keep me and everyone happy and healthy and motivated. Uh, thanks a million for joining me today, John and Dermid. And I really enjoyed that chat. Like I definitely learned a huge amount from it and I hope you all did too. And we really did get some useful tips and advice to keep everyone happy, healthy and motivated. So join me next week when we'll be looking at the whole world of sports journalism and sports photography. Thanks so much for watching guys. And remember, if you still want to register your school for the Future Leaders Programme in 2021 or 22, please visit our website learning.gaa.ie forward slash future leaders and fill in the registration form. So anyway, see you next week, guys. Bye.